Porsche. I wanna try ya. Crazy baby girl, there ain't nothing like ya. Yeah, the Porsche. So right, I had to get ya. Welcome to our first episode in a nine-part series called Evolution Number 2. And this series of episodes is mainly going to deal with population genetics, where we look at the genetics that deal with evolution, how allele frequencies will change, and you're going to learn what all those vocabulary words mean uh, throughout this screencast. And then finally, we're going to deal with what is science's answer for how life got here on the planet in the first place, and how has it gone through its myriad changes to the modern world. And we're gonna focus mainly on the endosymbiont theory when we get to that section. Well, first off, we're gonna begin with something pretty basic. We're gonna cover kind of some of the basic vocabulary as we move on through this chapter. And I wanna talk about Charles Darwin. Our last episodes from evolution number one, where we talked almost exclusively about Darwin's theory, is the one thing you wanna understand is there were some things that Darwin couldn't explain. You, you gotta remember, this is the middle 1800s. We didn't have all of our knowledge of genetics that we have today. So Darwin basically had no idea how these heritable traits got passed on to the next generation. He didn't know about genes. He didn't know about alleles. He didn't know any of that stuff. You know, that was Gregor Mendel's world. Now, even though Mendel was sort of a contemporary of his, Mendel's work really wasn't uh, discovered until after Darwin died, right around 19, 1900s when we found um, uh, Mendel's work. And actually, Mendel's work was not connected to Charles Darwin until the 1930s. So you're talking 80 years ago is when science made the connection between Gregor Mendel's work on genes and alleles and Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection. Okay, so in this series of screencasts, we're going to kind of take Mendel and we're going to take Darwin and we're going to put them together and show you how they make sense. All right, now there's two key ideas I want you to understand as we go through uh, these series of screencasts. Number one, natural selection does not act on, I'm sorry, let me rephrase this. Natural selection acts on phenotypes not individual genotypes, okay? Now, natural selection also works on the entire organism. It doesn't just pick this gene over the other. It picks the entire organism. In fact, every phenotype that an individual has is going to contribute to their fitness, okay? Now, I want you to remember that an adaptation is essentially a phenotype that increases your fitness, and fitness is defined as the ability to survive and reproduce. Now, However, I do want you to understand that it is possible for a single gene pair to be so bad that it could affect the entire phenotype to the point where it's no longer fit. Okay, We see these with some of these genetic diseases where you would perish before you have a chance to pass that on. Okay, But I want you to remember, natural selection works on the entire organism, not just individual phenotypes. You know, you probably have... 30,000 potential different phenotypes. Natural selection works on you as a whole, not as just individual gene pairs and whatnot. All right, so how do we define population? Because essentially what we're doing in Chapter 17 is we're looking at population genetics. So what do we mean by a population? A population is essentially a group of individuals of the same species that live in the same area and they interbreed, Okay. Uh, a species is defined as a group of similar individuals that can mate and produce fertile offspring. So they got to be able to breed and make their own offspring so that they can continue the species. That's, that's why that's important. Okay. Now a gene pool, this is all of the genes. And remember, another name for genes is allele. Remember allele, alternative form of a gene. These are all the alleles within that population. So I want you to look over here at this picture. Here we've got a population of wild pigs. And in this case, some of them are heterozygous, some of them are homozygous recessive, some of them are homozygous dominant, just like what you would expect within a, a population. Not everybody's of the same genotype. Now, if you were to take all of their alleles and stick them in a bucket, that would be called the gene pool. These are the genes that can move about within the population. So basically what we're saying is, this pig could mate with that pig, so they'd all have big bees. Or this pig can mate with that big pig, so you get some small alleles. Maybe it would mate with this pig, with that pig. All these genes are kind of 
kind of randomly be put into the offspring. So that's what we mean by gene pool. All right. Very important concept. Make sure you want to you make sure that you got these two vocabulary words down pat. All right. Now, another important concept that we're going to have is relative frequency. And this is really, really important. So I want you to pay attention on this slide because I'm going to mark all over it. And you've got to be able to handle some of this math because we're eventually going to get to a concept called the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium where we're going to use the math that we learn on this page. Okay, so let's go with this one. All right, now, frequency just means how often it occurs. So we could call relative frequency or allele frequency. Those are the same, same things. Now, this is the definition right here, so make sure you make a note of that. This is the number of times that the allele occurs within the gene pool. In other words, what percentage of the gene pool is this allele, all right? Now, it's often uh, listed as a percentage or as a decimal. So you could say it's either 50% of the gene pool or it's 0.5, okay? Those two things mean the same. Now, for example, we have 100 alleles in the gene pool. 75, 75 of those 100 are the dominant alleles. Therefore, the frequency of the dominant allele would be 0.75, which is 75 over 100, or 75%. Okay, I want you to come over here to this picture. Okay, now in this case, we have 48 individuals, 36 individuals, and 16 individuals. All right, so that comes out to conveniently 100 individuals in this uh, population. Okay, now if 48% of 100 are heterozygous, then we have... 48 mice, we'll just say that they're big A, small a. And then down here, we have 16 mice that are homozygous black. And we'll just say that's the big A's, okay? All right, and then down here, we have 36. So we have 36 mice that are little a, little a, okay? So if we have 100 mice, we're going to have 200 alleles in the gene pool because every mice or every mouse I should say has two alleles one for mommy and one from his daddy so 100 times 2 comes out to 200 oh. right? so let's figure out how many big A alleles that we have well these 48 have 48 big A's okay and then these 16 over here they've got two so 16 times 2 is 32 big A's so if you do your math, that comes out to 80, all right? These individuals down here, they don't have any big A's, so we're not going to pay attention to them, all right? All right, so how many little A's do we, do we have, okay? These 48 are going to have 48 little A's. These guys are going to have none. So here we have 36 times 2, which let me use my calculator because I'm just a ridiculous person when it comes to math. So we have 72 little A's coming from these guys. So if you do the math, it should come out to that. Now, to double check your math, we have 200 total alleles. So we have 80 big A's. We have 120 little A's. 120 plus 80 equals 200. All right, so what is our frequency of the little a allele? Well, it's 120 divided by 200. So let's punch in the calculator again. That comes out to... 6, in other words, 60% of the gene pool. And then the big A allele is 80 divided by 200. So 80 divided by 200 should come out to 0.4. So let's double check that. Bingo, I got it right. Didn't even really need a calculator on that. Okay, now that's how you figure out the percentage or the frequency of an allele in a gene pool. All right, now. I want you to look at this picture right now, or I'm sorry, this stuff in red. The allele frequency has nothing to do with dominance or recessive. It really is just a measure which allele is more common in the gene pool. Just because you're the dominant allele doesn't mean that you're the most common. Nature selects which of the two alleles is going to increase your fitness. Maybe the dominant allele does not increase fitness. For example, Huntington's disease, which is caused by a dominant allele, all right? Maybe the recessive allele increases your fitness. So over time, you would expect the recessive allele to be much more common 
because there's a selective pressure for it. And that's what we see up here in this mouse. In the, in the mice over here, maybe being brown gives you a competitive advantage because maybe their environment is more brown. They have higher camouflage, where these individuals would not have the same fitness, and that's why the brown allele is more common. Okay? All right. That's the first of nine episodes on population genetics and how life got here on this, on this planet in the first place. So we've just started our learning of our Evolution 2 menu. So until the next episode, we're going to catch you on the flip side.